Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them, and we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, The Plot. Number four, from Vault Comics, I absolutely adore this book. This is one of the best horror comic books on shelves right now. In fact, it's one of the best comic books on shelves right now. Four issues in, the story has become tr truly engaging and enthralling. Very cool stuff. Creepy, moody, atmospheric. Um, the artwork is just amazing. The character work is astounding. The dialogue flows. The pace of everything, it all works together in conjunction. Tim Daniel, Michael Morisi, they are the writers. The art team is Joshua Hickson and Jordan Boyd. And Jim Campbell rounds out that team on the lettering. Vault Comics does amazing work no matter what. Great sci-fi, horror, and fantasy comics. The plot is one of the creme de la creme over at Vault Comics. This book is amazing. It's very effective. It's spooky and it's scary. Horror has always been something that I found a little bit more difficult to be done in comic books, right? You do have your exceptions. You have your Hellboy. You have your Saga of the Swamp thing by Alan Moore. You've got good work out there, but usually you don't have as much great horror work on shelves as we do right now. The plot is one at the top. I love this book so much. It makes the pick of the week. Some great comic books out this week, but for me, this was by far the best, the most engaging, just truly captivating, and it really rose above uh, an exceptional group of comic books out this week. Let's get into DC real quick because DC's got a small week, so I only read a handful, but Batman number 86. I know this is a big deal for a lot of people because this signifies the complete finality of Tom King's Batman run, right? Batman is no longer written by Tom King. Now James Tynion IV has taken over. James Tynion IV has worked on Batman before. He worked on Batman Eternal, Batman and Robin Eternal. He did the, de the Detective Comics run when Rebirth first started. That was amazing stuff, like the Bat Family run. That was absolutely fantastic. His first issue solo on Batman is pretty decent. It's not going to blow you away or anything like that. I think it will blow some people away just because it's not Tom King. But it is good. It's a great solid start to a detective story, to a Batman story. We're dealing with the ramifications, the after effects, the aftermath of Alfred's death. Batman's got a new mission. He's kind of got a new vibe about him. Um, he's got some new partners, um, some people and some some familiar faces in, in different roles, I should say. But Batman number 86 is really cool. It's really solid. And with the tease from the last issue, which was Tom King's last issue, but James Tiny and had a little little teaser at the end there involving the Joker. That's a seed that's that's developing even further in issue number 86, but it's going to really take some time to blossom out into something really exciting. This has got some death stroke action, I'll tell you that, but Batman 86 is a pretty solid start to what should be a pretty solid run from James Tynion because he's already proven himself capable of writing the character Bruce Wayne and Gotham City. And 86, great job. Really did like it. From DC Black Label, we got a new one, Daphne Byrne. It's from the Hill House line of comics. We still have one more debut from Hill House after this that we know of. That's Plunge. Daphne Byrne, I actually read this about a month ago. I got a digital copy. I read it, and I wasn't that impressed. It's got artwork by Kelly Jones. And when I was growing up, I should say, when I was growing up, I wasn't a Kelly Jones fan. I was reading the Batman stuff, and I just thought it was so weird, so just off-kilter, and just didn't really work for me, right? But over time, I really started developing an appreciation for Kelly Jones' artwork. In fact, now I go back and I reread some of those Batman and Detective comics or whatever, and I love them. I think they're amazing. They're surreal. It's abstract. It's not going to be everybody's cup of tea. But what Kelly Jones really works with very well is horror. So Daphne Byrne's got really moody and atmospheric and classic horror artwork. If you know Kelly Jones's work, you know what I'm talking about. It's a little bit more like a, like there's like the first page right there. Really cool stuff. I like the artwork. The story though, it took me the second time reading it tonight and it really kind of ironed itself out. I found it to be creepy and atmospheric and moody and horrific, right? So I do think this is solid. It's got a great chilling cover. I don't think it's that solid as something as like the plot or a few more books that we're going to be talking about. But like I said, we're in a horror comic book renaissance right now. Daphne Burns, pretty solid start. I don't think it's going to be 
as impactful to most people as Dollhouse Family or a Basket Full of Heads, but I did like this first issue a little bit better than Low Low Wood. So Daphne Byrne number one is out this week from Hill House Comics. Oh, and it's written by Laura Marks. We talked a lot about Carolee Jones, but Laura Marks does a great job actually of building this creepy suspense and just mystery. Really cool stuff. Also from DC Black Label and Hill House this week, we have the Dollhouse Family number three. This to me is the shining beacon of Hill House right now. Three issues in, I'm loving the Dollhouse family. It's written by Mike Carey, Peter Gross on the artwork, Vince Locke, Chris Peter, rounding out that creative team. It feels old school, it feels like Victorian era horror, but it also feels like modern day horror. I absolutely love it. The artwork feels classic, the story is paced very well. Um, the dialogue, narration, everything, really provides a nice pace and flow throughout the book. Um, it's got a great mystery to it. It's got intriguing ideas, um, interesting characters and stuff like that. And great, great mythology and lore that it's pulling from. Um, the Dollhouse family is really cool and creepy and spooky. And this one, we take the story a little bit further and a little bit a little bit further ahead in time and a little bit further back in time. And we start to reveal some of those mysteries and develop some of these characters and really start hitting some strides getting this story even moving faster. I loved it. Dollhouse Family number three. I just, I just, and look at that cover. <sighs> Creepy. That's all I read from DC. It's a light week from DC. There are other things out there, but I'm just not caught up or reading some of those books, and I have officially given up on Young Justice. I'm not even, maybe I'll get back. I don't know, because what, uh, David F. Walker's coming in, right? Naomi's supposed to be joining? I don't know. We'll see what happens. For Marvel, we have Marvel's number one. Marvel's X number one, my bad. Marvel's X number one from Alex Ross, Jim Kruger, and Welby is the artist. Welby. Okay, well, well, I'll be. Um, but anyway, I, I liked it. I thought it was pretty solid. What Marvel's X is, is basically, we just recently celebrated 25 years of Marvel's. In fact, me and Jelani covered it in Comics Revisited, right? So it's a great video. If you haven't checked it out, you should totally check out our Marvel's Comics Revisited episode. Um, Marvel's is a great book, okay? And then Earth X is a really cool book that Jim Kruger did with Alex Ross. And so since there's the 25th anniversary of Marvels, they're kind of doing this whole line of new Marvels comics. We got a Marvel anthology coming. We got the Marvel snapshot one shots by Kurt Busiek and others. So what Marvels X is, is it's actually a prequel to Earth X. They're using the Marvels name. Okay, whatever. But I guess the idea being that you could view Marvels and Earth X, or the Earth X trilogy, I should say, as bookends to the Marvel Universe, right? You can you could actually do that. And then whatever Marvel comics you've read is the middle of it. You know, that's the majority of whatever you know as the Marvel Universe. However, anyway, Marvel's X is a cool little I, I like the wordplay. I like how it's kind of it's kind of establishing Earth X, the Earth X trilogy, and I'm just rambling right now, it establishes those as bookends for the Marvel Universe. Anyway, Marvel's X is a prequel to Earth X. You don't have to have read Earth X to appreciate this book. It still will tell a very interesting story. It will, it's about a, it's a post-apocalyptic um, world for the Marvel Universe. Basically what happens is something happens. We found out in Earth X and everybody on Earth has superpowers. Everybody has mutated and developed superpowers. So that's what Earth X is a reference to. So this is Marvel's X, how we go from the world of Marvels to the world of Earth X. So it's about when that first starts and it particularly places focus on one character and it starts developing his role. And it's very interesting. There's going to be something important about this character. Um, and, a, and a familiar face shows up in this book. But I loved it. I thought it was great. If you like Alex Ross's stuff, if you love Earth X, I highly encourage you to check it out. But like I said, even if you haven't read Earth X, you can totally read this book and just go right along with it, right? So I think it's cool. I really did like it. Ruins of Ravencroft Carnage is one shot. It's going to be a series of one-shots leading into the uh, the Ravencroft miniseries that's coming. It's written by Frank Thierry. It's got artwork by a couple of people, including um, Angel Unzueta. That's the modern-day stuff. And the flashback sequence is Julio Villa Villanova. I messed that up. But Villanova's part, the past part, that part was my favorite bit in this book. And it was the majority of the book. I was not looking forward to this. I'm like, okay, Absolute Carnage is coming gone. We're more excited about the fact that Null is awake and we want to know more about this. So this is just like, oh, so it's dealing with After Effects from Ravencroft and Carnage, Absolute Carnage, who, whatever, right? But, you know, I like Frank, Frank Thierry. I think he's a cool dude. He's a fellow Yankees fan. So I decided, why not? I'd check it out, right? I was very impressed with this book. It picks up 
A little bit after Absolute Carnage concludes, Ravencroft's been destroyed. It's being rebuilt. You got a little bit of Wilson Fisk in here, a little bit of Misty Knight, a little bit of John Jameson. Um, but then there is a flashback sequence, which is the majority of the book, that has an untold tale that's tied into the history of Ravencroft and the history of Carnage. And I really liked it. Maybe a little too convenient, but I really liked it, which gives me the idea that this is a series of one-shots developing the histories of some of these characters related to other characters, like Sabretooth's the next one, for instance. So I'm interested to see what's going to happen there. Anyway, I'll tell you this. I was not expecting anything out of this book, and I actually enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty solid. The The framing sequence is is okay. It was The book starts, and I was like, yeah, this is exactly what I was expecting. But when it does that flashback bit, I don't know. I really liked it, and some really cool revelations about the history of Carnage and Ravencroft and, and their connection. Really liked it. Miles Morales' Spider-Man, The End. So Marvel's doing a series of these end one-shots. They used to do these mini-series called Wolverine, The End, or Fantastic Four, The End, whatever, right? And since they're never actually going to get to the end of these stories, why not just be like, what What if? You know, what if? It's a what-if type thing. Anyway, Saladin Ahmed, who does currently write the Miles Morales book, tackles this one. It's a one-shot. It's a cool little fun story. I do not like the artwork. The artwork is Damian Scott. Um, and I love Damien Scott's work on, like, Batgirl back in the early 2000s or whatever, but did not like it on here. Yeah, Damien Scott did that. Did not, did not like it in here. Felt rushed. It's got a nice sense of energy and, and, and it's got some energy to it, but it's just, it's just kind of all over. I think, I don't think many people are going to like the artwork in this book. And the story is okay, but it's just because it's done in this one one shot, it just kind of goes really, really fast. So you don't really get the emotional impact of the final Miles Morales story that you should have. And that's probably going to carry on possibly into all of these one-shots because all the other The End stuff was like usually mini-series. And you, if you want to have an emotional impact, I don't know, but some, I don't know. Salon Am is a good, talented creator, but I just don't think this one worked. Didn't work for me. Anyway, but it's out this week. There's going to be even more of them coming up. Really uh, uh, curious about the Captain America one coming up because it's done by Eric Larson really weird star number one start of a new mini series star the breakout character from the recent issues of captain marvel kelly thompson um throws her into her own series and i actually really liked this book i did not expect much out of it just like ravencroft but it it was good i liked it a lot um star after what's happened she's kind of like a villainous character but she's trying, she doesn't really know whatever right but the big deal about Star right now is that she has the reality gem infused into her, right? So that's where the real fun stuff starts coming from this issue. So she's trying to, like, experiment with it and learn the how to use these abilities. And then all of a sudden familiar faces show up and be like, you're ruining reality. What are you doing? So it gets pretty fun, and I actually did enjoy it. It's just going to be a mini series. So if you've been reading Captain Marvel, it's not required reading. But if if this book does well... And Star continues to be kind of a popular character. And I do think a lot of her popularity was all in speculation, right? But if Marvel Marvel's picked up on the idea that she's somewhat popular, this could flourish into something bigger. I mean, the idea that she's got a reality stone inside of her is kind of a big deal, right? Anyway, Star number one is out this week. It's the start of a miniseries. I thought it was pretty decent. Speaking of Kelly Thompson, her second issue of Deadpool is here. And, uh, yeah, not even Kelly Thompson's going to keep me reading Deadpool for a long time. Chris Boccello, his artwork is a little bit more clear um, in this issue than it was in the first issue, but he's already been plagued by delays. Um, so I'm just not feeling it. It's all right. It's Deadpool. It's goofy. It's okay. I don't know. I guess he's the king of Staten Island now, and Staten Island has tons of monsters on it. Um, there are some nice little nuanced moments in here, mostly between a, converse, a conversation between Wade and Steve Rogers, and I really like that bit. Aside from that, though, it's just this Deadpool, man, and it's just, it's just, Kelly does a good job, I guess, writing Deadpool, and I guess, that, I, don't, I don't know, it's just, it's not going to be my cup of tea. Deadpool number two is out this week. Let's jump over to Don of X stuff. X-Force number five. Look at my boy Forge on the cover. Um, X-Force number five was amazing. Oh my goodness. Joshua Kassar's artwork, Dean White, the, the creative team behind this book is amazing. Benjamin Percy is almost out Hickmaning Hickman. At times, X Force is amazing. It's a flawless execution of the ideas that were established in Hawks Pox and the whole Hickman idea of the X Men, Krakoa, all this stuff. This has been so far, and there are a lot of there are a lot of seeds that are laid by Hickman in the X Men book, and possibly even a New Mutants. We'll talk about that. But X Force seems to be the X Men book right now. Like if you want to follow the story, if you loved Hawks Pox, this book you must be reading. This book's great. It's got 
great violence to it, some great Wolverine scenes, some great character work with Domino, some badass Forge moments, Queen Choir's head. <laughs> anyway, X-Force number five, Percy, Kassara, and the rest of the company, they're just doing such a great job. X-Force has been hitting it and nailing it every single issue. Issue five is no exception. No exception at all. Excalibur number five. This has been the book that I've been kind of wishy-washy with. I didn't, haven't really been liking it, but some of Apocalypse's pl plans come to fruition in this issue, and it's interesting to me. I really kind of... I'm. It's, there's a lot of interesting concepts that are going on in this book. I don't always feel like the execution's the best. Sometimes it just feels like too much in there and you can't really it's not like there's not like a clear directional pace throughout the book or something but this was one of the better issues of Excalibur I do think it's I don't think it's the weakest Dawn of X book at this point but I think it's the second to weakest but there's only like what five anyway Excalibur number five was pretty solid so if you've been waiting on this book to actually deliver on something I think you're going to get that delivery in issue number five but it's still not the greatest one out there New Mutants number five was so much fun. So this one's solely written by Hickman, and it's back to the idea of the old school New Mutants and some of the newer people like Chamber and Mondo and such. And now they're like having to escort Deathbird back to the Shi'ar galaxy, but there's all kinds of crazy intergalactic political mumbo jumbo craziness going on, right? This is really fun. There's a lot of dialogue on some of the pages, but it's really funny the way it's framed, and it's kind of referencing even some of the criticism of the X-Men books right now, especially with the way that they lay out um, all the information, all on like in, in walls of text and charts and graphs and stuff like that. Some nice cool commentary in there from Sunspot. But I actually liked it. Hickman's got a great knack for these characters. You can tell he has a respect and a love for these characters. This book is funny and it's lighthearted, but it does deal with some serious things and it gets very exciting. And I really think that I was thinking about it. It's like, why is Hickman on New Mutants. And I know that he loves these characters, but I was reading this, I was like, what is it? Don't forget that there's space stuff that Hickman's building up to. What's going to happen in this book? I think something's going to happen. Like involved in the phalanx or whatever? I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, Hickman and Rod Reese back on New Mutants, issue number five. I thought it was great. Fallen Angels, number five. This is what I would say is the weakest one. It's the weakest Dawn of X book, in my opinion. It started off pretty interesting, but the artwork has been inconsistent at times. It looks fine, and other times it looks very rushed and kind of choppy. The story's kind of like, the characterizations kind of are, are, are back and forth. X-23, it's not it's not a solid characterization, and neither is it with Kid Cable. Um, the Psylocke stuff is interesting, I guess. The, this has got a great scene with Sinister and Psylocke. It's got a great scene with Magneto. Excuse me, and Psylocke. But this is not doing it for me. It doesn't really feel super connected. I do think bits of all of these books are important to the future plans of, that Hickman and company have for the X-Men stuff. But just bits. This Apoth dude, it's interesting, but most of this book has seemed to be just meandering around, being somber and slow. I don't know. That's just me. Fallen Angels number five is out this week, though. Venom Island continues with Venom number 22. This is badass. This is badass. This is like Eddie Brock meets Rambo is what issue 22 of Venom is. Donny K is doing a great job. He knows what's happened with, you know, we got Absolute Carnage. It's just wrapped up. Venom is now on this island. It's the original island that he was on back in the day when, you know, he was trying to kill Spider-Man in the early 90s. Some great stuff, right? Um... So there are lots of references there, but basically his symbiote is now infested and infected with Carnage's symbiote because of the end of Absolute Carnage. So he goes to this Venom Island, um, and he's he's basically fighting his own suit because it's 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 possessed by Carnage, you know, and and Noel's coming, and so without his suit, he's on this island. What does he do? He becomes Rambo. Oh my goodness, it's so cool. It's seriously so cool. Mark Bagley, I Mark Bagley. Just the quintessential Venom artist, in my opinion. He's my favorite Venom artist. He's probably my favorite Spider-Man artist. I love Mark Bagley's work. But his recent work has, you know, not been his most solid. But I'll tell you this. This issue of Venom in particular has really solidified. This was really great, solid work from Mark Bagley. Donny Cates having fun, giving us a high, a highly octane, action-packed issue um, that still reveals a lot of crazy stuff, including what's going on with Dylan. Anyway, Venom number 22 is out this week. Immortal Hulk number 29 is out this week. I'm loving this story right now. Um, I wasn't fully on board with Immortal Hulk for a long time, 
but I'm really digging it right now. I still think Joe Bennett's pumping out some of the absolute best work of his career. So if you've been missing his presence on the artwork in the last few issues, rejoice because it's back. In this issue, basically, because of the ongoing war right now with Hulk versus Roxxon, Roxxon is unleashing all of these classic ancient Marvel monsters. And so I love stuff like that, and I think it's great. We're going to have an appearance of the original Hulk again. Real fun stuff. I'm really liking it. Look at this book. Look at the detailed, powerful artwork by Joe Bennett. Look at those beautiful, amazing colors. They they work. They work so well. I absolutely love it. Some really cool psychological stuff. And can you catch the Crowley um, uh, appearance in the issue? I know you can, because I did. Immortal Hulk number 29 is out this week. The Amazing Spider-Man number 37 is here. Nick Spencer's wearing me down on this book. But this was a nice refresher, because it kind of got back more into the idea in the vein of a classic Spidey story. And that's what Nick Spencer kind of started off doing. He has moments where that shines. We're getting back to the idea of who is this mystery, mystery villain. We got some revelations in this one. We got some really intriguing things that happened at the end of it. We got Ryan Otley back on the artwork. Um, so it's a little bit more of a fun what I'm used to with Spencer Spider-Man, what I can deal with, what I can handle. I just feel like the 2099 stuff got so bogged down, hunted, got so just overwrought. But we still haven't gotten... I don't even remember the dude's name. What's the dude's name? What's the dude's name? Do you even know? Who am I talking to? There's nobody there. Um, no, the villain. The new villain. I can't remember his name right now. I can't even... Anyway, that, that dude, we need to get to it. But it feels like there's a moment in here where the, that dude is talking. And I feel like it's Nick Spencer talking to criticisms much like the criticisms I've been giving the book of late. So I really feel like maybe we're getting to the point. Like, maybe we're about to start doing something. Then I realize, oh yeah, we're 13 issues away from 50. Yeah, so we got 13 issues. Ghost Rider number four is here. Um, this book is decent. It's okay, but it's nothing like, it's not a must read. And if you want to make a Ghost Rider book successful, you got to make it a must read. That's how you make a book that most people wouldn't pay attention to. That's how you make it hype. That's how you make it fire. That's what Donny Cates did with Venom. I mean, and I love Venom, and I know a lot of people love Venom, but Venom solo books have never been the highest sellers. Ghost Rider's one of those kind of things. You gotta do something big, you gotta do something momentous, and this is just kind of picking up the pieces from Donny Cates' damnation story that he kind of left dangling. Johnny Blaze has been down in hell, we're gonna finally deal with it. I mean, it's decent, it's not bad, it's not a bad comic book, but it's not really doing anything to make me want to pay attention to it, aside from just the slight fandom I have for Ghost Rider. But it's not strong enough to keep me interested, the story really, it needs to really push forward. That's what I've been thinking. Then you get to the end of issue number four, and I think it may have hit that moment. We shall see. But this, I was set on, I, will, I almost didn't even read this. But then I was set, as I was reading, I was like, this is going to be my last issue of Ghost Rider. I might, I might read the trade or something. Then I got to the end, I'm like, well, damn it. I gotta read issue number five. You son of a bitch. I'm in. Anyway, Morbius, the living vampire number three is out this week. Vita Ayala doing a great job of taking your typical Morbius story, but they're putting like a real fun, modern, very horrific and violent and grotesque uh, spin on it. I really do like it. I think it's great. Um, the artwork is by Ferreira, and that is Marcelo Ferreira, um, Roberto Poggi on the inking, um, Doncho Sanchez Almara on the coloring. Um, I think Ayala and company, they're doing a great job on this book. Um, it's, it's not the best thing out there. But I have a big affinity for, for Morbius and for Ayala's work, so I'm really liking this one. I think it's cool. It's not going to change your life, but it's a nice, fun, horrific vampire story, much in the vein and, and, and style of 70s Marvel horror which is like one of my favorite eras of comic books ever. So there you go. Star Wars, The Rise of Kylo Ren, number two. Issue number one of this, which I kind of gave a mediocre review. I'm sorry I didn't tell you guys to go get it up because that book skyrocketed. That book became hot. Why? Because people want to know about the Knights of Ren. I want to know about the Knights of Ren. If you want to know about the Knights of Ren, definitely read this one. The issue number one I thought was kind of eh. Issue number two, though, start learning a little bit about those Knights of Ren. Start seeing a little bit of how badass the Knights of Ring can be. Really cool stuff. It's decent. It's basically Snoke buddying around with, you know, Kylo Ren, kind of, you know, sp spitting into his ear, twisting him, turning him to the dark side, all that kind of stuff. But you got the Knights of Ren in it. Anyway, it's all right. It's actually pretty good. I thought this was way better than issue number one. Issue number one did not engage me, did not intrigue me, but I picked up issue number two anyway because I am a Kylo Ren fan and Jay Strick actually convinced me to do it. Um, but I'm glad I did, because this is some really cool, proper Knights of Ren action. I liked it. Let's jump over to Image Comics. The Clock. 
The Clock, number one, is a new one from Image slash Top Cow. It's written by Matt Hawkins with artwork by Colleen Doran. Very interesting, right? So I, I read it, and it's it's interesting. It's decent. It's basically, let me try to remember, because I read it like an hour or two ago. Um, there's a viral form of cancer now sh striking the planet, but certain populations are almost like immune to it, right? So it's about the scientist that's going around all these different places, and he's trying to figure out what exactly is going on. It's about weaponized cancer. It's got some intriguing ideas. It's got some... Really great artwork, some nice subtle moments, um, some moments that are very effective and kind of like actually hit you hard, right? But overall, the book just didn't completely engage me. Like I had to think for a second about what the concept of the story was. And I don't even remember the big twist. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He has a death in his family, and it turns out that it may not be exactly what it is. But it's got some really nice, nuanced human moments. This book I wouldn't completely write off yet, but... Issue number one could have done a better job of sinking its claws into me, but it's got some really touching moments, some really highly nuanced moments, um, and a decent concept. And when you get to the back matter, and they're really talking a lot about, about like weaponized cancer and stuff like that, that's like really scary, weird ideas. So maybe that's that's worth exploring to see where they're going with that one. Anyway, also from Image Comics this week, Gideon Falls number 20. It's always a new, great new comic book day when Gideon Falls is out. This is one of the best comic books of the week. It's one of the best comic books on shelves. It's been one of the best comic books for two years solid now. Jeff Lemire, Andrea Sorrentino, Dave Stewart. It just, comics, pff. we were talking about, I was talking about how we're in a new age of, of horror comics. This is leading the charge too. This, the plot, Dollhouse Family, come on. There's so much great horror work out there right now. Lemire, Sorrentino, when they're working together, they can do no wrong, especially when they're joined by Dave Stewart, one of the best colorists in the business. This book is uber creepy, highly effective, scary, skin-crawling, bone-chilling, soul-numbing, chilling. That's what this book is to me. It's very effective, and it works so well. It's a big mystery. This is not a book that if you haven't been reading Gideon Falls, don't, don't just jump in. <laughs> don't just jump in get the first trade paperback give it a read this has been one of my favorite comic books for two years running and it does not show any signs of letting up this book just keeps building on its momentum on its mystery and on its magic how about that for alliteration anyway gideon falls number 20 is out this week a cinder number eight is out this week from image comics and writer jeff lemire dustin Wynn on the artwork this book is great descender which came before was such an amazing sci-fi space opera epic from Jeff Lemire and Dustin Wynn. Now we're getting this magical fantasy epic from them, and it's amazing. It's set in the same world. You would think that you couldn't do that. You can't all of a sudden turn a sci-fi story into a fantasy story. You can't do that, right? Not a hard, like, this is science fiction. This is magic and fantasy. You can't do that. Yes, you can. And they've done it with Descender into Ascender. I absolutely love this book. I think this is a great issue. Some great moments. Um, some really great moments about Mother, kind of the villain of the piece now. Some really interesting ideas about the vampires and their hierarchies and how they work. And just... <laughs> Ascender. Gideon... It's Jeff Lemire. Every, he's got Midas right now. He's Midas. He's Midas. 20XX number two from Image Comics. Lauren Keeley, Jonathan Luna. Man, this was the biggest disappointment of the week for me. I loved issue number one. It blew me away. I thought it was so meticulously crafted, so well executed. Issue two, oh my goodness, walls of text. Walls of text, yo. Walls of text all throughout this entire damn book. I'm serious as hell. This book, it bothers me. I'm trying not to be too passionate. I don't want to hate it, man. If you read this and you see something in it that you really like, please let me know. But like, I loved issue number one and I thought it was well executed. Issue number two, boring, stagnant, exposition-y, highly overly verbose, walls of text, just stiff, just uninteresting, boring. What a shocker to me. I was so excited to read this book. And then I'm just like, what? And it, it pulls itself at the end, and it has a nice reveal at the end that keeps you interested a little bit. But man, this was a chore to get through. This was a big disappointment for me. Wow. I, that, 
That almost hurts. Sonata number seven. I was not expecting Sonata to come back so soon, but I'm glad it did. I love Sonata. It was one of my favorites of 2019, and it's got a great start into 2020. It's a new story. I had to have a little bit of a refresher in my head, though, um, to remember exactly where we left off, but it does keep that story going. It adds some new twists, some new dimensions, some new elements to it. Now the story feels like something... At first, Sonata felt like something that was going to be like five or six issues and done. Now it feels open. I feel like now that they know they got the space to tell more story, the story is open. There's a mystery that's revealing itself. Sonata, fantastic. I'm loving the artwork. David Hine, Brian Haberlin, um, Gerard Van Dyke. I just love this book. Sonata number seven kicks off the new storyline, and we got the trade paperback coming out, Valley of the Gods. So if you haven't checked out Sonata yet, I encourage you to do so. I really like it. It's a nice sci-fi fantasy for you. Trees, Three Fates, issue number five. Warren Ellis, Jason Howard, the final issue of the third volume of Trees. And Trees is such an interesting concept, right? Basically, these giant, like, pillars just fall from space onto Earth. And they just cause all kinds of commotion, like electromagnetic commotion. Sometimes they spill out this toxic sludge. They create these black flowers that, like, infest people's brains or something. But this book... And all of these three volumes has never been about the trees, but it's about how humanity picks up the pieces. The, the, the least important thing, it seems, about trees is the trees. Um, so issue, volume three really kind of was a big U-turn, like a completely different story. It had a very fun ending. It was a very satisfying ending, a very quick ending, and a very snappy and very action-packed. And that's what Howard and Ellis have been doing. They've done it on trees. They've been doing it. They did it on Cemetery Beach. So that's what they do. This was a very brisk read, a very quick read. But as I, when I was done with them, I was like, man, I got to re I want to reread all three volumes again, but I really want some more of this mystery about the trees to come out. And I know that there's no plans right now for book four. I'm sure there are plans for book four. They want to do a book four, but as far as I'm aware, there's no ideas for book four yet. So that means I don't know if Warren Ellis knows where the story's going. But what is interesting is that this book is not about the science fiction concept that's happening. It's about how humanity c continues around it. We kind of, they start ignoring it. It's about ignoring the problem. So, I mean, I like it. I like trees. I do. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, number two. <sighs> A fanboy's dream. I loved it. Great, highly charged, kinetic, dynamic artwork. Fantastic characterization. The voices all ring true. Ryan Parrott is the writer of the Power Rangers book right now, and he's doing a great job on GoGo -Go as the co-writer and on Mighty Morphin as the sole writer. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I mean, come on. This is like two of my favorite properties from when I was like, when I was like a kid and a teenager, you know, preteen or whatever. You know, maybe, I, yeah, I, maybe I was, I was like 15 watching Power Rangers. Anyway, um, but I, I love this book. I think it's amazing. If you're a fan of TMNT or Power Rangers, you're going to like it. If you're a fan of both like me, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. This book is amazing. And it's got a really cool bit at the end. Um, really cool bit. Really cool bit. Could could look cooler, though. They could have made that look cooler. I think, they could, I think, I, I think there's a way that you could have made that look even cooler. But anyway, this book is amazing. It's just a fanboy's dream. It's fun. It's just fun. That's, and that's what comic books should be, right? Sometimes comic books should just be fun. Sometimes they need to scare the hell out of you. Sometimes they need to make you think. But sometimes they just need to be fun. And that's what that is, and it's perfect. Strange Guys over East Berlin, number four. This is the final issue. Boom has just been killing it, doing great books. Strange Guys over East Berlin is one of those books. Jeff Loveness, Lissandro Estherin, Patricio Del Pecci. Just a fantastic book. I love the artwork. Um, it's subtle. It's a different style. Esther is the artwork or the artist on Redneck, but the style, especially with the coloring, it's different. It's a little bit more nuanced. It's got a little bit more texture to it. And I really like it. This is a very satisfying conclusion. I really did like it. I'm very eager now to sit down and read all four issues together because it was a very touching ending. It was an unexpected ending. Um, this book, basically about, you know, a UFO crashes over East Berlin, and so you get all the spy stuff. It takes place in the 70s. This dude's undercover over in, in, in East Berlin, and, and, and so you got this, like, espionage, like, suspenseful kind of stuff going on, um, but then you got this, like, this element of this alien, right, but the book is about human nature, the book is about lies and truth and things like that, and I just absolutely adore it. Jeff Loveness is a great writer, he recently did, not too long ago, the Judas miniseries at Boom, and this is another four-issue miniseries from Loveness and Company that is absolutely astounding. Strange Guys over East Berlin, Magnolfi. 
Dying is easy. Issue number two is out this week from IDW. Joe Hill, Martin Simmons. Martin Simmons got nothing great. I mean, nothing but great things to say about the artwork in this book. I absolutely love it. It's textured. It's gritty. It's funny. It's exciting. It, it, it provides everything that you need. It's, it's filled heavy with atmosphere and character. The story in this one, though, didn't do it as much for me as issue number one. I really liked issue number one. This is basically about an ex-cop, a disgraced ex-cop, who is now a stand-up comic. And now he is being, you know, so at the end of the first issue, he, like, punches this dude, this, like, comedian that steals people jokes, and he, like, beats the shit out of him or something, right? And now, all of a sudden, that dude turned up dead, and he's a suspect in the murder, so now he's running from the police. So that's never going to go easy. But the book felt a little stilted. It felt a little stiff. It didn't really flow as well as the first one. It got a little bogged down in dialogue at times. So it was still decent. It was still interesting, but it didn't quite hit me as hard as issue number one. But I will continue to read this because I think that a Shit Talk Holmes mystery is something that I would be into. So I love the artwork in this book. But issue number two, story-wise and execution with the script... Could have been a little bit better from issue one. Issue one was really, really solid. From Vault Comics, plot made pick of the week, but don't forget Relics of Youth. Relics of Youth number four, wrapping up the first initial story arc. I would love to see this book return because it has a really cool setup for future stories at the end of this one. Lots of explaining and explanations. What exactly is going on? How these kids are connected? How they're connected to the Fountain of the Youth and the Bermuda Triangle and these who are these people that are coming trying to kill them and stuff like that. So it's got a little bit of, of like a, a lost vibe. Um, it feels a little bit like a young younger version of lo uh, of Lost with you know, that really leans into its mystical thing. Because um, Lost didn't really do that until towards the end. But this is definitely its own thing. But it's really fun. I like it. Relics of Youth, number four. Wrapping up the first arc, and I'm dying to see more. That was really good stuff. And finally, let's talk about Knight's Temporal, which also wraps up its first initial arc. No plans right now, I think of, solidified for it to return. But it definitely leaves things dangling for a possible return. And it does say, not the end at the end of it. So you always like seeing stuff like that. Cullen Bunn doing this one with Fran... Uh, Galan really did like this one. Knights Temporal's got a cool um, concept. It's about this, you know, Crusader Templar knight or whatever that winds up getting split across time. And he winds up in the Old West. He winds up in the modern day. He winds up in the nighttime. You know, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, but the ending was a little bit frantic and rushed. So I, I definitely want to sit back and reread and see if the ending will flow a little bit better. But just reading it on its own, and it has been delayed, I think, just a little bit. Um... But it, it felt a little frantic and rushed. It really, really did. So I definitely got to sit down and reread these because I loved issues one through four. And so I definitely want to see if a reread will iron out that ending. Anyway, that's what I read. That's what I thought about it. What are you reading? What are you excited about? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe and join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts and a whole lot more. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.